Due to the work of Charles Darwin in the 19th century and the subsequent Darwinists after him, the theory of evolution has captivated many minds in this world, offering to people a way to explain the origins of the kinds of creatures we see on Earth. Darwinists claim all the kinds of creatures on Earth evolved from a common ancestor. They assert humans evolved from ape-like creatures, etc. They maintain this evolution occurs through the key mechanisms of mutation and natural selection, which refers to forms of life acquiring different traits, which better allow them to survive, and then the passing of such traits through reproduction onto the next generation. Over time, they say, such changes eventually result in the emergence of different kinds of creatures. There is microevolution, which refers to changes or variation within a kind. This is observable and accepted by everyone. Then there is macroevolution, which refers to the emergence of new types or kinds of creatures due to mutation and natural selection over long periods of time. It is this idea of macroevolution which is the point of contention for many scientists today, and it is what this film will be primarily focusing on. Indeed, a great number of scientists today are voicing their doubts about this macroevolution or Darwinism, noting that they do not believe the key mechanisms of mutation and natural selection lead to the emergence of new types or kinds of creatures. As Harvard biologist Nathaniel Jensen explains, if evolution means microevolution, a term evolutionists use to refer to small changes, or those changes we can observe, then yes, evolution happens. When evolution is used synonymously with the phrase survival of the fittest to reproduce, a process Darwin referred to as natural selection, then it is fair to say that evolution has happened. We observe survival of the fittest commonly. The changes in the sizes and shapes of the Galapagos finch beaks illustrate this well. When evolution is equated with macroevolution, then it depicts a fanciful hypothesis and not an observable fact. If the creatures we see today actually evolved from other kinds of creatures in the past, gradually over long periods of time, we would expect to find in the fossil record their intermediate or transitional forms with halfway structures. There should be innumerable examples of this. However, we do not observe this. Instead, what we find in the fossil record are fully formed fossils with the exception of a handful of debatable alleged transitional fossils Darwinists bring up. This is a serious problem for Darwinism. Charles Darwin himself worried about this issue. He wrote, Why is not every geological formation and every stratum full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain, and this is the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against this theory. Around 100 years later, the famous evolutionist author Stephen Jay Gould Likewise noted the fossil record does not actually support this Darwinian gradualistic view of evolution. The absence of fossil evidence for intermediary stages between major transitions in organic design, indeed our inability, even in our imagination, to construct functional intermediates in many cases, has been a persistent and nagging problem for gradualistic accounts of evolution. And. I regard the failure to find a clear vector of progress in life's history as the most puzzling fact of the fossil record, but I also believe that we are now on the verge of a solution." Unquote. Indeed, Gould admitted there are serious problems with the fossil record, yet he went on to claim that his punctuated equilibrium idea that evolution occurred through sudden big jumps could solve this problem. However, his proposed solution turned out to be erroneous as well. As Emil Sylvester notes, quote, They, Gould and Eldridge, were not even willing to explain from whence such a massive addition of genetic information could have come. Thus, after Gould's passing away, punctuated equilibrium lost popularity, and gradualistic neo-Darwinism became the ruling dogma in academia again. In his work Darwin's Doubt, Stephen Meyer showed many other problems with punctuated equilibrium as well. Hence, the fossil record problem Gould admitted existed still remains. In light of concerns from such high-level evolutionists as Gould, one should be skeptical towards the popular evolutionary apologists today who try to claim the lack of intermediate forms in the fossil record is not a serious problem. 
the fact is that fully formed organisms appear abruptly in the fossil record. For example, the chemist and science writer Jonathan Sarfati notes, the first bats and birds in the fossil record are indeed fully fledged flyers. Moreover, the oldest known turtle in the fossil record is fully formed. We have no intermediates between turtles and cotylosaurs, which are the organisms evolutionists claim turtles supposedly came from. And the quote-unquote imperfection of the fossil record excuse will not work since organisms like turtles leave excellent fossils but still show no intermediates. This is because macroevolution is a delusion. Although Darwin himself, as well as modern Darwinists today, claim that the reason we do not find these transitional forms is because the fossil record is supposedly imperfect, this attempt at saving face will not work for other reasons as well. John D. Morris notes, Extensive exploration and fossil discovery in the following years after Darwin have not brought such in-between forms to light. The vast majority of taxonomic orders and families which live today are also found as fossils, yet without fossil transitions. Indeed, this is confirmed by biochemist Michael Denton, who in his work Evolution, A Theory and Crisis, showed 97.7% of living orders of land vertebrates are represented as fossils, as well as 79.1% of living families of land vertebrates, 87.8% if birds are excluded, as they are less likely to become fossilized. In fact, all 32 mammal orders appear abruptly and fully formed in the fossil record. So the idea the fossil record is incomplete is false. Now, Darwin also tried to address the transitional fossil problem by claiming the alleged imperfection of the fossil record was, quote, chiefly due to organic beings not inhabiting profound depths of the sea. However, Emil Silvestru notes, this excuse is likewise false, since the idea life did not exist in the depths of the sea has since been disproven. A final word on transitional forms from Sarfati, quote, The inability to imagine functional intermediates is a real problem. If a bat or bird evolved from a land animal, the transitional forms would have four limbs that were neither good legs nor good wings. So how would such things be selected? The fragile long limbs of hypothetical halfway stages of bats and pterosaurs would seem more like a hindrance than a help, unquote. The Cambrian Explosion is a very strong refutation of macroevolution as well. The Cambrian refers to an early period of geologic history. Scientist Stephen Meyer notes, During this geological period, many new and anatomically sophisticated creatures appear suddenly in the sedimentary layers of the geologic column without any evidence of simpler ancestral forms in the earlier layers below. If macroevolution is true, and these creatures in the Cambrian evolved from simpler forms, the earlier layers below should contain such forms, but they do not. This is a serious problem for Darwinism. Another aspect of the Cambrian explosion is brought out by John D. Morris, quote, The Cambrian explosion constitutes a major episode in the history of life. If evolution were true, one would expect the record to start with one type of animal, then increase to two, and so on. Yet fossil studies have shown that essentially all phyla were present at the start, each distinct from the others, and each fully equipped to function and survive. Even vertebrate fish were present in the lower Cambrian. There is no evolutionary tree found in the fossils, as Darwin and his disciples have claimed. Rather, it is more like a lawn than a tree. Indeed, this data troubled Charles Darwin a lot, and he admitted it was a very difficult problem for his theory. Even over 100 years later, the evolutionist professor Jeffrey Levington admitted this is evolution's, quote, deepest paradox, end quote. Moreover, in regards to Darwinian attempts at answering the Cambrian explosion, paleontologist Mark McMenamin conceded, it is hard for us paleontologists, steeped as we are in the tradition of Darwinian analysis, to admit that neo-Darwinian explanations for the Cambrian explosion have failed miserably. New data acquired in recent years, instead of solving Darwin's dilemma, have rather made it worse. Thus, one should be skeptical when evolution apologists claim the Cambrian explosion is not a problem. Now, Darwinists teach chemical evolution or abiogenesis, that is, the idea there was an initial self-reproducing single-celled organism that arose due to some natural chemical process, and that this was the first life on Earth from which all other life subsequently evolved. 
Yet, because this is not science and can't be proved through observation and testing, evolutionists often resort to saying, the origin of life has nothing to do with the theory of evolution. However, evolutionist Gordon Slack rebukes such a cop-out. I think it is disingenuous to argue that the origin of life is irrelevant to evolution. It is no less relevant than the Big Bang is to physics or cosmology. Evolution should be able to explain, in theory at least, all the way back to the very first organism that could replicate itself through biological and chemical processes. Likewise, zoologist and physiologist Gerald Kirkett defined the general theory of evolution as the theory that all living forms in the world have arisen from a single source, which itself came from an inorganic form. Hence, the erroneous nature of abiogenesis does have an impact on evolutionary theory, despite claims to the contrary. The idea of abiogenesis states that perhaps ammonia, carbon dioxide, water, and other gases at the time of the early Earth were jump-started, either by lightning or radiation, which acted as an energy source to somehow form the first single-celled organism, life from non-life. A cell contains, among other things, proteins, which are formed by amino acids. However, scientist Stephen Meyer calculated if one factors in the need for proper bonding and homochirality, the probability of constructing a rather short, functional protein at random becomes so small, one chance in 10 to the 125th power, as to approach the universal probability bound of one chance in 10 to the 150th power, the point at which appeals to chance become absurd given the probabilistic resources of the entire universe. Moreover, he calculated that to generate a single functional protein of 150 amino acids exceeds one chance in 10 to the 180th power, and notes, it is extremely unlikely that a random search through all the possible amino acid sequences could generate even a single relatively short functional protein in the time available since the beginning of the universe. In regards to the Darwinist attempts at recreating abiogenesis in the lab, they were unsuccessful. In the 1953 Stanley Miller and Harold Urey experiments, using chemicals and gases to recreate what they thought the environment of the early Earth looked like, and using man-made electric charges, they were only able to produce six of the 20 amino acids used in biological proteins of a cell. They were only able to produce the simplest amino acids needed for proteins and not the more complex ones, which can't be created using such techniques. Their systems tended to destroy amino acids as quickly as they were produced. The chirality problem prevented their few simple amino acids from being used in real-life proteins. And while functioning proteins only tolerate left-handed amino acid isomers, such amino acid production results in both left and right-handed amino acid isomers being produced at the same frequency. Hence, man's attempt to recreate abiogenesis is a failure, and actually demonstrated abiogenesis is erroneous. Science writer Greg Easterbrook asks, If life began unaided under primordial conditions in a natural system containing zero knowledge, then it should be possible, it should be easy, to create life in a laboratory today. But determined attempts have failed, no one has come close. Likewise, biochemist Stuart Pullen observes, In the scientific journals, scientists routinely dismiss many aspects of the abiogenesis hypothesis as highly improbable. While several amino acids can be created under plausible conditions, proteins cannot be. During Darwin's day, people believed in the spontaneous generation of life from non-living matter on the assumption that the cell was allegedly just a simple lump of albuminous combination of carbon, as Darwin's student Ernst Haeckel suggested. However, as one scientist explains, the cell is an information processing and replicating system of astonishing complexity. This astonishing complexity of the cell is evidence it did not arise naturally. As Stephen Meyer notes, cells employ a complex information processing system to access and express the information stored in DNA as they use that information to build the proteins and protein machines that they need to stay alive. Scientists attempting to explain the origin of life must explain how both information-rich molecules and the cell's information processing system arose. To imagine a cell with its high information content and the ability to reproduce arose naturally is baseless and impossible. Evolutionist Paul Davies expounds on the problem. Most of the workings of the cell are best described not in terms of material stuff, hardware, but as information or software. Trying to make life by mixing chemicals in a test tube is like soldering switches and wires in an attempt to produce Windows 98. It won't work because it addresses the problem at the wrong conceptual level. 
which leaves us with a curious conundrum. How did nature fabricate the world's first digital information processor, the original living cell, from the blind chaos of blundering molecules? How did molecular hardware get to write its own software? German origin of life researcher Bernd Olaf Kuppers observed, the problem of the origin of life is basically equivalent to the problem of biological information. In regards to the nature of the cell's complexity and information, Stephen Meyer elaborates on Francis Crick's sequence hypothesis. The sequence hypothesis suggests that the nucleotide bases in DNA functioned like letters in an alphabet or characters in a machine code, just as alphabetic letters in a written language may perform a communication function depending on the sequence. So too, Crick reasoned, the nucleotide bases in DNA function in precisely the same way as symbols in a machine code or alphabetic characters in a book. In each case, the arrangement of the characters determines the function of the sequence as a whole. As Dawkins notes, the machine code of the genes is uncannily computer-like. Or, as software innovator Bill Gates explains, DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software we've ever created. Evolutionists have faith the origin of the digital information in DNA can be explained by abiogenesis, but such an idea is clearly erroneous and contrary to common sense. The information in DNA actually refutes abiogenesis. In fact, after restudying this kind of evidence, the Nobel laureate chemist Richard Smalley recently came to the conclusion that life must have been created by design. Darwinism had a good run, but in light of us discovering these kinds of things Darwin was ignorant of, we need to now move on to the 21st century. Now, some evolutionists have claimed that maybe the first biomolecules were actually composed of RNA instead of amino acids forming themselves into functional proteins, serving as the first enzymes. However, for a refutation of this erroneous idea, see the geneticist Jeffrey Tompkins' essay, The Mystery of Life's Beginnings. For example, he notes, RNA and DNA molecules are composed of five nucleobases, two sugars and a phosphate. The nucleobases contain two different pyrimidines. Therefore, before an evolutionist even considers the possibility that RNA was the first major biomolecule, he must first explain the origin of these necessary nucleobases. In his essay, he highlights other serious problems as well. Now, the abundance of material challenging abiogenesis has led many high-level evolutionists to admit that they do not know if abiogenesis occurred or how it could. For example, evolutionist Paul Davies said, one of the great outstanding scientific mysteries is the origin of life. How did it happen? The truth is, nobody has a clue. In one documentary film, evolutionist Richard Dawkins even claimed, out of desperation, that aliens perhaps seeded life on Earth. This is because Darwinists do not have a clue if or how abiogenesis happened naturally. Indeed, even though many high-level evolutionists admit they do not know if abiogenesis occurred, or if it even could, it is still nevertheless dishonestly taught as fact to the public. Many school textbooks and popular television programs do this. For example, in the 2010 book Philosophy of Biology, popular evolutionist writer Eugenie Scott matter-of-factly claimed, but at some point in Earth's early history, perhaps as early as 3.8 billion years ago, life in the form of simple single-celled organisms appeared. Once life evolved, biological evolution became possible. Likewise, the popular 2011 National Geographic television documentary, The Story of Earth, although admitting they don't know how it happened, matter-of-factly claimed it did. The water has become a chemical soup. It's impossible to know how or when, but somehow these chemicals have come together to create life. It is because such popular books and television programs dishonestly tell people abiogenesis matter-of-factly occurred even though Darwinists admit they don't know if or how it even could, which is why so many naive people in our society are persuaded to believe abiogenesis. Another item to observe is there are fossils dated to supposedly many millions or even billions of years old, which show a stasis or stability compared to living specimens today. In other words, these fossils appear the same or nearly the same as modern living examples of the same species. This should not be if evolution is true and species have been evolving for many millions or even billions of years. In order to try to explain this, some Darwinists claim evolution only happens when it needs to. However, this proposal is refuted by the fact that Darwinists also claim some fossil populations went unchanged 
through extreme climate change and world catastrophes, even though on this proposal, they should have changed and adapted. John D. Morris highlights the difficulty. The fossil record features stasis as a dominant trend. It does not speak of major changes. Evolution or the descent from a common ancestor model demands that major changes visited every population. But this is the evolutionary story, not the conclusion drawn from the fossils. The following are some examples of this stasis which refute Darwinism. Stromatolites, that is the remains of blue-green algae colonies, dated supposedly to 3.5 billion years old by Darwinists, are virtually unchanged compared to living specimens today. Darwinists claim to have found 445 million year old horseshoe crab fossils, yet they are identical to horseshoe crabs of today, except for being smaller. The size discrepancy, however, may be because of the age at which the creature was fossilized. What is more, in 1938 a living coelacanth was caught off the east coast of South Africa, yet Darwinists claimed this creature had been extinct for 65 million years. Moreover, upon examining this living coelacanth, it has been shown to be nearly identical to fossil examples which are allegedly hundreds of millions of years old. Moreover, Darwinists claim to have found a fossilized jellyfish in the rocks of Utah dated to half a billion years old. Yet, compared to living jellyfish, they are virtually unchanged. This means no substantial change occurred in 500 million years. Emil Silvestru highlights the implications. Half a billion years puts this into the middle of the Cambrian era, when multicellular life was first evolving. Thus, this jellyfish has remained unchanged through the entire evolutionary history of multicellular life on Earth, while one of its cousins went on to evolve into people. To maintain macroevolution in light of all this counter-evidence clearly demonstrates Darwinists will believe it no matter what. Another point refuting macroevolution is the irreducible complexity of the cilium of the cell, the flagellum, and the eye. Charles Darwin stated, If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. The irreducible complexity of organs or systems we mentioned are ones that could not have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications. Scientist Michael Behe explains irreducible complexity means that a system has a number of components that interact with each other and that if any are taken away, the system no longer works. In regards to the cilium of the cell, this refers to little hair-like organelle on the surface of many types of cells. The cilium has the ability to beat back and forth, moving liquid over the surface of the cell. In some lung tissue, each cell has hundreds of cilia that beat in synchrony. Scientific research has shown the cilia are extremely complex molecular machines. There are many parts that make up the cilium, such as nine double microtubules, two single microtubules, nexin protein, radial spokes, a connecting bridge, and dynein, etc. Involved in this machine is sliding, motorization, tension, reaching, attaching, pushing, etc. It's quite complex. Michael Behe explains why it is irreducibly complex. If it were not for microtubules, there would be nothing left to slide. If the dynein were missing, the whole apparatus would lie stiff and motionless. And if the necks and linkers were missing, the whole apparatus would fall apart when the dynein started to push the microtubules, and it does in experiments when the necks and linkers are removed. Concerning the bacterial flagellum, it is an outboard motor or rotary device which pushes against liquid like a propeller, thus enabling certain bacteria to swim. The propeller is made of protein called flagellin. The propeller is connected to the drive shaft by hook protein enabling rotation. The drive shaft is connected to the rotary motor, which uses outside acid to power the motor's turning. Various proteins then act as bushing material, allowing the drive shaft to poke through the bacterial membrane. Nearly 40 different proteins are needed for a functional flagellum. Some of the amazing features of the bacterial flagellum are self-assembly and repair, water-cooled rotary engine, proton motive force drive system, forward and reverse gears, operating speeds of up to 100,000 RPM, direction reversing capability within one-fourth of a turn, signal transduction system with short-term memory, Michael Behe notes how this system is irreducibly complex in light of 40 different proteins being required for function. 
In the absence of most of those proteins, one does not get a flagellum that spins half as fast as it used to, or a quarter fast. Either no flagellum gets produced at all, or one that does not work at all, much like a cilium or mouse trap. The flagellum requires a number of parts to work, therefore it is irreducibly complex, and its origin presents quite a stumbling block to Darwinian theory. Again, Darwinism had a good run for its time, but now we need to move on to the 21st century. Behe has responded to the various attempts evolutionary apologists have made in trying to address this irreducible complexity. Moreover, Sarfati has likewise responded to such critics on the issue in his book Refuting Evolution 2, as well as noting how the eye is irreducibly complex as well. Thus, such examples stand as valid refutations of Darwinism. Evolutionists argue because embryos of humans allegedly look similar to embryos of other various creatures that this is proof of common ancestry. However, this argument is based on Ernst Haeckel's late 19th century embryo drawings, which were proven to be frauds. Haeckel was Charles Darwin's student and was even known as Darwin's Bulldog of Germany. After Haeckel published his drawings in 1868, various scientists exposed him to be a fraud who modified them so they appeared alike at early stages. Embryologist Michael Richardson explains, This is one of the worst cases of scientific fraud. What he, Heckel, did was to take a human embryo and copy it, pretending that the salamander and the pig and all others looked the same at the same stage of development. They don't. These are fakes. What is even more tragic and deceptive is that Heckel's fraudulent embryo drawings are still being used in various school textbooks even to this day. What is possibly even more deceptive is how in his 2007 book Evolution, the popular evolutionist writer Donald Prothero admits Heckel's embryo drawings had errors and oversimplifications, yet on the same page he uses George Romain's 1892 embryo drawings as proof for evolution when those drawings were just reproductions of Heckel's fraudulent drawings. They are the same drawings when you compare them. This deception is staggering. It's quite revealing that popular Darwinists such as Richard Dawkins and Michael Shermer still nevertheless endorse Prothero's book. Here are embryologist Michael Richardson's photographs of real embryos of humans and different creatures, showing how different they actually look at the earliest stages compared to Heckel's and Remain's fraudulent, deceptive drawings, which helped mislead many to accept Darwinism. As one can see, human embryos do not actually look like the embryos of those other organisms at the earliest stages of development. Thus, Prothero and the other textbooks which use such pictures are wrong and misleading people. Now, the fraud Ernst Heckel also claimed embryos allegedly look the same because in early stages of development, they are retracing their evolutionary history. This false idea is called biogenic law. However, Yale biologist Kay Thompson noted, Surely the biogenic law is as dead as a doornail. It was finally exercised from biology textbooks in the 50s. As a topic of serious theoretical inquiry, it was extinct in the 20s. Nevertheless, as a final futile effort to maintain this specious position, Prothero asks why human embryos have pharyngeal pouches resembling gill slits of fish, etc. The answer is, as biologist Jonathan Wells notes, in a fish, pharyngeal folds later develop into gills, but in a reptile, mammal, or bird, they develop into other structures entirely. In reptiles, mammals, and birds, pharyngeal folds are never even rudimentary gills. They are never gill-like, except in a superficial sense that they form a series of parallel lines in the neck region. In other words, there is no embryological reason to call pharyngeal pouches gill-like. And Sarfati observes some similarity among embryos such as pharyngeal pouches make, quote, perfect sense from a design standpoint. To construct anything, you begin with something without shape or with a basic form, and then you add increasingly specialized details, end quote. Only when one begs the question assuming Darwinism and rejects design a priori, do they see this false evidence as proof for common ancestry? Lastly, biologist Nathaniel Jensen, citing S.F. Gilbert's developmental biology, notes, Profound and obvious differences are present at the four-cell stage, two-cell diversions after fertilization. Such a deep divide among classes of species at such an early stage of development clashes with the predictions of universal common ancestry. Now, Darwinists claim peppered moths are proof of evolution. Evolutionist writer Donald Prothero argues, during the Industrial Revolution, soot in the air made the tree trunks black 
and the normal form of moth was conspicuous. Instead, a dark-colored mutant became dominant. Because they were well camouflaged against the dark tree trunks, while the birds picked off the normal speckled varieties, when environmental regulations cleaned up the air and eliminated the sooty tree trunks, the normal speckled varieties returned, and the dark mutants were again selected against. However, there are problems with using this as proof for evolution. First, this textbook story is full of holes for various reasons. For example, scientists don't know where moths rest during the day. They do not actually rest on tree trunks. The popular videos of moths on tree trunks being eaten by birds during the day were actually just laboratory bred ones placed on tree trunks by evolutionist Bernard Kettlewell. Thus, when birds preyed on Kettlewell's staged tree trunk moths in his filmed experiments, the moths were not even in their natural hiding places. Similarly, evolutionist Theodore Sargent confessed that he helped glue moths onto trees for a popular Nova documentary in order to make evolution appear to be true. Likewise, the still photos of moths resting on trees in various textbooks are actually just dead moths which were glued onto tree trunks. Yet these fraudulent photos are still nevertheless used in countless textbooks as proof for evolution even to this day. Secondly, given the textbook story, all it would show is that gene frequencies were shifting back and forth by natural selection within one created kind. It doesn't show, given even millions of years, that such a process could add the complex design information needed for macroevolution, that is, the change into a different kind. Jonathan Wells highlights the deception involved in regards to students. A Canadian textbook writer who knew that the peppered moth pictures were staged used them anyway. You have to look at the audience, how convoluted do you want to make it for a first-time learner? Bob Ritter was quoted as saying in the April 5th, 1999 Alberta Report News Magazine, high school students are still very concrete in the way that they learn, continued Ritter. The advantage of this example of natural selection is that it is extremely visual, visual perhaps, but untrue, Ritter explained. We want to get across the idea of selected adaptation. Later on, they can look at the work critically. Apparently, the later on can be much later. When University of Chicago professor Jerry Coyne learned of the flaws in the classical story in 1998, he was well into his career as an evolutionary biologist. His experience illustrates how insidious the icons of evolution really are, since they mislead even professionals. Coyne was understandably embarrassed when he finally learned that the peppered moth story he had been teaching for years was a myth. My own reaction, he wrote, resembles the dismay attending my discovery at the age of six that it was my father and not Santa who brought the presents on Christmas Eve. Darwinists claim man evolved from ape-like creatures and over the years have attempted to prove such with various fossils. In the beginning of the 20th century, an amateur archaeologist named Charles Dawson claimed to have found the missing link between humans and apes in a series of digs in an England gravel pit. After first finding skull fragments, Dawson alerted Arthur Smith Woodward of the British Museum. Dawson, Woodward, and a paleontologist named Teilhard then engaged in more digs in the area. They found a large skull that was modern in shape and a lower jaw that was primitive or ape-like. They also found stone tools. Because there were some skeptics, Dawson then claimed he found another Piltdown man a few miles from the first dig site to try to legitimize or confirm the first one. This led to the majority of the paleontological world accepting Piltdown Man as legitimate, as well as countless people accepting Darwinism. It wasn't until 1953, however, over 40 years later, that Piltdown Man was discovered to be a hoax. The modern-looking skull was determined to be that of a modern human. The other bones and stone tools were undoubtedly planted in the pit. The jaw was chemically treated to look like a fossil and turned out to be the lower jaw of a female orangutan. The area where the jaw would meet the skull was broken off to hide the fact it did not fit the skull. The teeth were filed down to make them look human, etc. The British Museum has documented other quote-unquote discoveries of Charles Dawson that turned out to be fakes as well. Near the end of the first quarter of the 20th century, a tooth was found in Nebraska in the United States. Evolutionists claimed it was that of an ape man and called it Nebraska Man. Darwinists even made illustrations of the so-called advanced ape in 1922 for the Illustrated London News publication, which misled many people. It was even erroneously used as evidence to mock the biblical creation position by the Darwinist Henry Fairfield Osborne 
during the famous Scopes trial of 1925. There, Osborne mocked the Christian William Jennings Bryan, saying, It is certainly singular that this discovery is announced within six weeks of the day that the author advised William Jennings Bryan to consult a certain passage in the book of Job. Speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee. Well, it turns out the tooth from which the whole Nebraska man was reconstructed and promoted actually just belonged to a pig. There was no Nebraska man. The August 1972 edition of the National Geographic put out a major article concerning the discovery of an alleged Stone Age ape-man tribe called the Tassidae in the Philippines. National Geographic even created a documentary film on the subject that same year called The Last Tribes of Mindanao, which led to many people accepting Darwinism. However, Swiss anthropologist and journalist Oswald Eiten discovered this tribe, which allegedly proved evolution, was actually just an elaborate hoax created by a Philippines government agency in order to raise money, which was then subsequently embezzled by the leader of that agency. It was a complete fraud. In 2005, the German anthropologist Rainer Prosch von Zieten was forced to retire as a professor for fabricating data in an attempt to show an alleged link between Neanderthals and humans. His quote-unquote discoveries were accepted by the scientific community for nearly 30 years before he was finally exposed as a fraud. The Guardian noted, He erroneously claimed a skull fragment found near Hamburg was 36,000 years old and the missing link between Neanderthals and humans. According to experts, his deceptions may mean an entire tranche of the history of man's development will have to be rewritten. Moreover, Neanderthals discovered in 1856 were not brutish cavemen as we see in older Darwinist illustrations and depictions. Instead, Neanderthal men were modern men. There is evidence to characterize them as culturally similar to other humans living contemporaneously with them. Although Neanderthals are often presented as inferior to modern humans, Neanderthal expert Eric Trinkos concluded, Detailed comparisons of Neanderthal skeletal remains with those of modern humans have shown that there is nothing in Neanderthal anatomy that conclusively indicates locomotor, manipulative, intellectual, or linguistic abilities inferior to those of modern humans. Modern discoveries also show Neanderthal were capable of symbolic thought and engaged in leisurely activities such as cosmetics, which proves they were fully human in their thinking and activity. Even Darwinist writers such as Donald Prothero admit Neanderthal, quote, could not be our ancestors, end quote, which is an important statement needed to refute the misconceptions of a lot of the general public who believe Neanderthals were our ancestors and somehow prove macroevolution. Lastly, Jonathan Wells notes although French paleontologist Marcelin Boulle claimed Neanderthals were cavemen with a stooped posture, midway between apes and humans, quote, paleoanthropologists are now convinced that Boulle was wrong and that Neanderthals walked upright just as we do. Now, such frauds and hoaxes we covered have not stopped modern Darwinists from parading other alleged ape-man evidence. In the late 19th century, Dutch anatomist Eugene Dubois found some bones which would be called Java-man. He claimed it was an intermediate between apes and humans, the missing link. His Java-man was just a skull cap that he felt looked both ape and human, and a thigh bone or femur found 50 feet away a year later that he assumed belonged with it. Although the skullcap and femur have been presented to the public together as Javaman, the association between the two has always been questioned by many of the most reputable anatomists from the time they were discovered until today. Moreover, regarding the idea the skullcap is both ape and human, the famed Cambridge anatomist Sir Arthur Keith studied it and concluded it was instead distinctly human. Moreover, virtually every authority except Dubois who studied the femur concluded it belonged to a modern human. Evolutionists now claim Java Man is Homo erectus, that is, a member of the human family, but a different species of human. However, there is a problem. More recent studies showed the skull of the Pecking Man believed to be Homo erectus as well, and Java Man were quite similar. Yet, they also showed the femora of the Pecking Man differed from the femur of the Java Man, in the places where the Java Man femur was similar to modern humans. This led to the conclusion that the Pecking Man femora is Homo erectus, while the Java Man femur was not true Homo erectus, but a modern human's. This is a serious problem for evolution, since a modern human's femur would be associated with an alleged Homo erectus's skullcap. And, as Marvin Lubino observes, if the Java skullcap and femur actually belong together, then it is difficult to maintain a species difference between Homo erectus and Homo sapiens. The distinction would be an artificial one, and it would compromise these fossils as evidence for human evolution. 
If, on the other hand, the skullcap belongs to Homo erectus, and the femur belongs to Homo sapiens, it shows that these two forms likely lived together as contemporaries. It likewise removes these fossils as evidence for human evolution, because fluorine analysis indicates that the fossils are both the same age. The Javaman skullcap and femur are evidence that the distinction between Homo erectus and Homo sapiens is an artificial one, that these two forms are both truly human and they lived as contemporaries. The differences attributed to evolution are instead evidence of the wide genetic variation found in the human family. Darwinists claimed creatures such as Homo rudolfensis, Homo gaudentiensis, Homo ergaster, and Homo habilis were all different species of ape men. However, a recent discovery of a Homo erectus skull in Georgia has led many scientists to conclude this is wrong and that all these alleged different species were all just one species, the Homo erectus species, which is what the previously discussed Javaman and Peking man are also claimed to be. The Guardian reports, Analysis of the skull and other remains at Deminisi suggests that scientists have been too ready to name separate species of human ancestors in Africa, and everything that lived at the time of the Deminisi was probably just Homo erectus, said Professor Zollicoffer. If this is true, it throws the modern study of human evolution into disarray. So the question is, was Homo erectus even an ape man which proves human evolution? Is Homo erectus morphologically distinct enough to warrant its being classified as a species separate from Homo sapiens? We already showed how Javaman and Peking man bones indicate Homo erectus were just Homo sapiens, yet there is even more evidence to consider. For example, Sarfati notes, Homo erectus was just a variety of real human. This was shown by morphological analysis of various traits which are all human except supposedly for the intermediate brain size. But even in this trait, their cranial vault size overlapped with that of modern people. As recently as 2001, Wolpoff et al. showed that the features of various human skulls indicated that there must have been interbreeding among modern-looking Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, and even Homo erectus. The cultural abilities of Homo erectus are also strong evidence of their humanity. They even had evidence of seafaring skills. Thus, many paleoanthropologists regard Homo erectus as a member of our own species, Homo sapiens. Lucy is the name of a set of bones Darwinists call Australopithecus afarensis. Lucy was discovered in Ethiopia in 1974 by Donald Johansson. Concerning Lucy, evolutionist Richard Dawkins writes, The species we call Australopithecus afarensis, Lucy species, included our ancestors of three million years ago. Thus, Darwinists claim we evolved from Lucy species, and that Lucy is transitional from apes to humans. As proof of this, Dawkins claims Lucy's kind, quote, walked upright on their hind legs, as we do, end quote. However, evidence shows Lucy had wrist-locking abilities classic for knuckle walkers. Moreover, Sarfati observes cat scans of Lucy's inner ear canal showed Lucy did not walk habitually upright like us. As Dawkins claims, what is more, anatomist Charles Oxnard's 1975 study of such bones led him to the conclusion that Lucy was not transitional between apes and humans, or of the human line, as they were more distinct from both apes and humans than apes and humans are from each other. Moreover, later in 1984, he found Lucy was not structurally similar to humans, and that such creatures lived contemporary, or almost so, with the genus Homo which disproves the idea of there having a place in human lineage. Also, scientists Matt Cartmill, David Pilbeam, and Glenn Isaac surveyed 100 years of paleoanthropology and noted, At present, we have no grounds for thinking that there was anything distinctively human about Australopithecine ecology and behavior. They were surprisingly ape-like in skull form, premolar dentition, limb proportions, and morphology of some joint surfaces, and they may still have been spending a significant amount of time in the trees. The Australopithecines are rapidly shrinking back to the status of peculiarly specialized apes. Also, Lucy's teeth refute the idea she was a human ancestor. A paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences USA published in 2007 noted the gorilla-like anatomy of Australopithecus afarensis mandibles, which was unexpected, and casts doubt on the role of Australopithecus afarensis as a modern human ancestor." End quote. In arguing for an evolutionary relationship between humans and apes, popular evolutionist writer Jerry Coyne claims, We share 98.5% of our DNA sequence with chimps. Other Darwinists have said 98%. However, this figure is based on flawed and biased research, which we will show. 
Darwinists engage in deception when they neglect to tell people the fact that even a 2% difference between chimp and human DNA is astronomical. Humans have around 3 billion base pairs of DNA in each cell, so a 2% difference amounts to 60 million base pairs of DNA difference. That is a massive amount of new information to account for. Mutation and natural selection do not add genetic information, and so Darwinism can't account for this alleged new information in the human. What is more, there are problems with the 98% figure, as we stated. Geneticist Jeffrey Tompkins notes, The current chimpanzee genome was not constructed on its own merits. Instead, the human genome served as a framework for developing it. All of the short DNA sequences produced from the chimpanzee genome were assembled onto the human genome, using it as a reference sequence. This problematic shortcut was taken due to budget constraints, convenience, and a healthy dose of evolutionary presuppositions that humans evolved from apes. Indeed, he elaborates, noting, Sizable portions of non-similar sequences are typically omitted, markedly enhancing the reported similarity data. Another problem is that researchers pre-select human and chimp DNA sequences that are already known to be quite similar, while non-similar DNA is omitted. As a result, estimates of similarity are inflated because of this cherry-picking of the data. An inflated human-chimp DNA similarity is then reported to the general public bolstering the case for human evolution. Based on newer and more reliable 2013 research into chimp and human DNA, Tompkins observes, the chimp chromosomes were on average between 66 and 76 percent similar to human, depending on the chromosome. Surprisingly, the chimp genome on average overall was only found to be 70 percent similar, end quote. Thus, chimp and human DNA is not actually 98 percent similar, but 70 percent. And when one takes into account that according to a 2000 study, humans are 60% similar in DNA to the fruit fly, the Darwinist argument evaporates into silliness. They fail to consider the similarity in DNA points to a common designer, rather than common ancestry. What is more, Darwinists won't tell you the Y chromosome of the chimp is radically different than that of the human. The difference in its gene content is said by scientists to be comparable to the difference in autosomal gene content between chickens and humans. In order to prove macroevolution, Darwinists have attempted to show that birds evolved from dinosaurs. Indeed, in 1999, the National Geographic magazine even went as far as publishing an article claiming that a set of bones evolutionists called Archaeoraptor were proof of dinosaur to bird evolution. However, Archaeoraptor was later discovered to merely be a human-constructed forgery consisting of bones from different creatures. It was a fraud. Nevertheless, many Darwinists are still persistently teaching dinosaur-to-bird evolution. One of the alleged proofs for it they cite today is what is known as Archaeopteryx. Evolutionist Jerry Coyne asserts, the first link between birds and reptiles was the crow-sized Archaeopteryx. However, the paleoornithologist world authority on birds, Alan Fiducia, affirmed, Paleontologists have tried to turn Archaeopteryx into an earthbound feathered dinosaur, but it's not. It's a bird, a perching bird, and no amount of paleobabble is going to change that. In his 1996 work, The Origin and Evolution of Birds, Fiducia showed much evidence Archaeopteryx was not a feathered dinosaur. Sarfati further reports, Archaeopteryx possessed the unique avian lung design with air sacs and one-directional airflow, highly efficiently designed to flow in the opposite direction of the blood for maximum oxygen uptake. This is totally different from the bellows-like lungs of a reptile. One of the first intermediate forms would have a hole in the diaphragm, so natural selection would work against it. The air sacs require a fixed thigh bone for support, yet dinosaurs had movable thighs so could not have supported an avian lung system." End quote. Also, Archaeopteryx had core features that defined birds, such as flight feathers, wings, perching feet, and a wishbone. It is just an extinct bird. Moreover, using a new technique, scientists have recently discovered the feathers of Archaeopteryx share the same biochemistry with today's feathers. This disproves the idea of evolution of feather chemistry in birds. A final word on alleged bird evolution. The supporters of various evolutionary camps score mortal blows against the mechanisms proposed by their rival camps. With the origin of birds, there are two main theories, that birds evolved ground up from running dinosaurs, and that they evolved trees down from small reptiles. 
both sides produce devastating arguments against the other side. The evidence indicates the critics are both right. Birds did not evolve either from running dinosaurs or from tree-dwelling mini-crocodiles. Now, Darwinists want people to believe that whales evolved from some form of land mammal. Here is a common Darwinist illustration allegedly showing whale evolution. However, this drawing is deceptive since, for example, Basilosaurus was 10 times longer than Ambulocetus. Yet, when these creatures are drawn about the same size, the Darwinist story appears more plausible. And there are other problems as well. For example, an alleged transitional link between land mammals and whales is known as Pachycetus. The Darwinist Philip Gingrich discovered some skull fragments of this creature, which appeared to be wolf-like, but, as he claimed, allegedly had ears like a whale's. This led Gingrich to hastily claim the animal caught fish while swimming like a whale as an intermediate, with its belly touching the ground while on land, like a whale's would if it were on land. This idea was quite popular and resulted in fanciful drawings of this creature that go well beyond what Gingrich's skull fragments actually proved. After Gingrich's false claims, new research based on more recent Pachycetus finds have blown away his Darwinist views. It turns out Pachycetus was actually just a fast-running land mammal with only its feet touching the ground. This is another example of Darwinists exaggerating the evidence and interpreting it in an evolutionary framework in order to promote Darwinism, thereby misleading people. Here's a diagram showing what he thought Pachycetus originally looked like compared to what it actually looked like. Moreover, Darwinist Jerry Coyne claims Pachycetus had, quote, whale-like ears, end quote. However, Emil Silvestro notes, the ear bone is not at all like a whale, which has a finger-like projection sigmoid process. No, this one is plate-like, like land animals known as artiodactyls. Moreover, based on the fossil remains associated with Pachycetus, it is clear it lived in a fluvial or continental environment, and not a marine environment, which is where whales live. There's no evidence Pachycetus could hear underwater, or that its ears could maintain pressure during alleged diving. And since its teeth resemble those of mesonychids, which ate mollusks, carrion, and tough vegetables, this shows Pachycetus was nothing more than a land mammal, with no connection to whales. Another alleged transitional form between whales and land animals is known as Ambulocetus. Evolutionist Bill Nye argues, Ambulocetus walking whale fossils were discovered in what is now Pakistan. It is an animal that has whale flippers and feet with toes. These animals evolved into our modern whales." End quote. However, Emil Silvestro notes, Dr. Hans Thuesen claimed that eight features showed Ambulocetus was a whale ancestor. Dr. Carl Werner recorded Dr. Thuesen admitting that a key evidence of whale ancestry, the alleged sigmoid of the ear bone, was actually nothing like a whale's. Dr. Werner says, all eight characters he reported as whale features are disturbingly non-whale features. Indeed, in that video interview, the Darwinist discoverer and expert of Ambulocetus, Hans Thuesen, admitted it is questionable whether or not both Ambulocetus and Pachycetus had a sigmoid ear process like a whale. Yet, Darwinists claim their alleged whale-like ears are the proof they evolved into whales. Lastly, commenting on the confusion among Darwinists regarding whale evolution, Sylvester notes, Evolutionists cannot agree on which land animal gave rise to whales. Based on fossil similarities of teeth, some paleontologists favored hyena-like animals, while others preferred a cat-like animal. However, based on recent comparisons of DNA evidence, molecular biologists decided hippos were the closest to a whale ancestor. But there are huge problems with converting a hippo into a whale, like how a land animal gains the ability to give birth and nurse underwater. One argument for evolution and against intelligent design Darwinists make has to do with alleged bad design in nature. We will examine some of the major arguments, though they've all been addressed. Richard Dawkins argues the human eye is badly designed, since not everything is focused in our vision, but only what we focus on, unlike modern cameras. Quote, when we scan a scene, we move the fovea over different parts, seeing each one in utmost detail and precision. A top quality Zeiss or Nikon lens really does show the whole scene with almost equal clarity. However, the system of the human eye has two advantages over against a hypothetical eye that focuses perfectly everywhere in the periphery. One, the lack of focus in the periphery has a certain advantage in that we can concentrate more easily on the objects finely focused in our central vision. Two, 
a perfect focus in the periphery would be wasted unless our brains could process this information, and that would require heads too big to fit through the doorway. Dawkins also argues, the eye's photocells are pointing backwards away from the scene being looked at. The wires connecting the photocells to the brain run over all the surface of the retina, so the light rays have to pass through a carpet of massed wires before they hit the photocells. That doesn't make sense. However, ophthalmologist George Marshall notes, the idea that the eye is wired backwards comes from a lack of knowledge of eye function and anatomy. He notes that nerves could not go behind the eye, since that area is reserved for the choroid, which provides the rich blood supply needed for the retinal pigment epithelium, and that's needed to absorb excess heat and regenerate photoreceptors, so it is necessary for nerves to go in front instead. And as for the idea nerves are like a carpet interfering with image, this is false, since nerves are virtually transparent because of their small size, which is brilliant design. Evolutionist Bill Nye writes, one of the most obvious human design puzzles is that our waste disposal plumbing is immediately adjacent to our reproductive and pleasure-producing plumbing. Your anus is right next to either your penis or your vagina. If you were in charge, wouldn't you have separated those a bit? Well, where would such Darwinists suggest the anus should be? The knee? The stomach? The back? Such locations would make it awfully difficult to use the restroom. The fact is the anus is in the perfect place for restroom use. Moreover, during the God-made act of sexual intercourse, the proximity of the anus to the genitalia doesn't really matter or affect the activity. This is a silly, strange argument made out of desperation. In his book Evolution, which is endorsed by Darwinists such as Richard Dawkins and Michael Shermer, evolutionist Donald Prothero defines vestigial organs as organs that are remnants of past structures but no longer serve a function. Darwinists claim the existence of such organs prove evolution and refute intelligent design. However, Sarfati notes, it is impossible to prove that an organ is useless and thus a vestige of evolution. The function may simply be unknown and its use may be discovered in the future. This has happened with more than 100 organs in humans that we now know are essential but which evolutionists formerly deemed were useless leftovers of evolution. This is a clear case where evolution has impeded the development of science. We will address some of the popular examples of alleged vestigial organs Darwinists still bring up. Prothero lists alleged vestigial organs of the human body which supposedly prove evolution. He mentions the appendix, tonsils, and tailbones of humans, none of which have a function now. However, this is not science. These organs do have function. The lymphatic tissue in tonsils are a defense against viral, bacterial and fungal infections in the throat area. They are very necessary. Likewise, the appendix contains lymphatic tissue and helps control bacteria entering the intestines. Also, the appendix provides a safe house for beneficial bacteria so they can repopulate the large intestine after a distant area attack flushes out all bacteria. In regards to the tailbone or the coccyx, it's actually designed to be a critical point of muscle attachment for muscles of the pelvic floor. Now, in regards to flightless birds, Richard Dawkins says, All flightless birds, including ostriches and their kind, which lost their wings a very long time ago, are clearly descended from ancestors that used to fly them. However, Sarfati responds, We agree with Darwin and Dawkins that flightless birds, at least most of them, descended from flying birds, losing their ability to fly. Once again, this is post-fall de-evolution, not evolution. If Dawkins could show creatures acquiring the power of flight or sight, then this might count as evidence for evolution, but loss of flight or sight does not. This example of a vestigial structure does not support macroevolution. The ostrich is still a bird, and the flying bird is still a bird. Plus, such short wings in flightless birds do have functions, such as balance, protection of the ribcage during falls, mating ritual, and sheltering chicks, etc. In regards to alleged vestigial organs of whales, Prothero notes they quote, have tiny hips and thigh bones buried deep in their bodies with no function whatsoever, end quote. However, these bones are not useless but help with reproduction or copulation. They strengthen the whale's reproductive organs. Moreover, these bones are quite different in male and female whales, which is best explained by creation and not evolution. They're not vestigial. Now, are Darwinists accurate in their dating techniques when they date various fossils and rocks to millions or billions of years old? Darwinists depend on millions and billions of years for their theory, so if the evidence proves their dating techniques are erroneous and that the Earth is actually young, 
Their theory is jeopardized. They claim radiometric or radioisotope dating methods prove that the Earth is 4.54 billion years old. They arrive at the age of the Earth based on things such as rocks in western Greenland being dated by four independent radiometric dating methods to 3.7 to 3.8 billion years old, and by the Canyon Diablo Iron Meteorite being dated to 4.54 billion years old using similar methods, etc. However, there are well-known difficulties with these dating methods. The various radiometric dating methods include uranium lead dating, potassium argon dating, samarium neodymium dating, rubidium strontium dating, etc. The assumptions involved in these dating methods are 1. Known initial conditions of the sample. 2. The amount of parent or daughter elements altered only by radioactive decay. And 3. Constant decay rate or half-life. We can test these assumptions by looking at many of the erroneous results of such dating methods. There are numerous cases where rocks that are known to be young are erroneously dated to be old by radiometric methods. This calls into question those assumptions. For example, volcanic rocks from New Zealand's Mount Garahoe were radiodated by a respected laboratory. Despite the fact the rocks were known to have been formed during eruptions less than 50 years earlier, potassium argon dating yielded ages for the rocks ranging from less than 270,000 years to 3.5 million years. Realizing this problem, Darwinists developed isochron dating to try to work around it. However, in attempting to clear up the Mount Garahoe results, the isochron dating actually made things worse by a factor of over 70 million. The following studies show that isochron methods also make assumptions and often yield contradictory results. Moreover, there are other cases where different radioisotope clocks, and even the same clock applied to different parts of the same geological formation, often yield dramatically different ages. What is more, in regards to carbon dating, Richard Dawkins notes, The half-life of carbon-14 is between 5,000 and 6,000 years. For specimens older than about 50,000, 60,000 years, carbon dating is useless. Thus, since carbon-14 decays rather quickly and has this rather short half-life, there should be no detectable carbon-14 left in samples after, say, a million years old. In fact, carbon-14 should be totally undetectable after about 90,000 years, according to scientists. Yet, carbon-14 has consistently been found in specimens that were radiodated to millions of years old. This calls into question radiometric dating. In fact, carbon-14 is found in abundance in coal allegedly ranging in age from 35 million to 315 million years old. And carbon-14 has even been found in diamonds that are dated to over a billion years old by radiometric dating. This is strong evidence against radiometric dating assumptions. Now, the typical response will be that they know their dating of certain fossils, comets, and earth rocks is accurate because they use independent radiometric methods in their analysis to come to their conclusions. However, a team of scientists known as the RATE team, or Radioisotopes and the Age of the Earth team, selected two locations to collect rock samples to conduct analyses, likewise using multiple radiometric dating methods, just as the Darwinists do. These experiments tested whether or not using independent radiometric methods is as reliable as evolutionists claim. The sites they chose were the Beartooth Mountains in Wyoming, and the base rapid still in the Grand Canyon. The rock samples, whole rocks and separate minerals in them, were collected by rate and then analyzed using four independent radiometric methods including potassium argon dating, rubidium strontium dating, samarium neodymium dating, and lead lead dating. To eliminate bias, the team had different professional labs located in Colorado, Massachusetts and Ontario, Canada conduct the dating procedures. The Beartooth Mountains were previously dated to 2.79 billion years old by Darwinists. However, the results of the rate analysis showed extensive differences in the ages for the various minerals in the rock and also between the radiometric methods themselves. In some radiometric methods, the rock age is greater than the age of the minerals in it, and for other radiometric methods, the mineral age is greater than the rock age. The potassium argon mineral results varied between 1.52 billion and 2.62 billion years, a difference of 1.1 billion years. This is devastating. As for the base rapid still analysis, it is claimed to be 1.07 billion years old by Darwinists. However, the rate analysis yielded much different results. The potassium argon isochron age turned out to be 841.5 million years old, yet the samarium neodymium isochron age turned out to be 1.379 billion years old, a difference of 537.5 million years. This undermines the Darwinist idea that multiple radiometric methods being used in the same analysis 
enables one to rely on the dating of rocks, comets, and fossils to millions or billions of years. Science writer Brian Thomas reports, Disconcordant radio dates are very common. Many have been published in scientific literature, but many are never reported. One researcher admitted, In the majority of cases, the ages are clearly off and the data disappear in a lab data file. Another study summarized 30 radioisotope ages that were all older than the relevant geologic chart said was possible. Another study filled 10 pages with reported disconcordant dates. Thus, when a Darwinist confidently tells you that a rock or fossil is millions of years old, or that the Earth is billions of years old, one should be skeptical. The world is 4.6 billion years old, and I've um, mentioned this calculation many times before. Now, there's other evidence for a young Earth which refutes Darwinism. For example, helium has been found in zircon crystals dated to 1.5 billion years old by radiometric dating. Yet, if such zircon crystals were truly that old, little helium should remain in them since helium atoms leak or diffuse quite quickly. Yet, large amounts of helium have been found in such specimens. This is scientific proof for a young Earth. Also, the documented yearly buildup of salt in the oceans, which we know increases faster than it escapes, proves a young Earth. Since, if the Earth was billions of years old, calculations show there would be so much salt in the oceans, life could not survive in them. Another proof is the very little sediment on the sea floor. Geologist Andrew A. Snelling notes, if the Earth was billions of years old, there would be many miles of sediment accumulated on the sea floor. This is because every year, water and wind erode around 20 billion tons of dirt and rock debris from the continents onto the seafloor. Yet, the average size of this sediment globally on the entire seafloor is barely 400 meters. Due to tectonic plate sliding, an estimated 1 billion tons of sediment are removed each year. Nevertheless, an enormous 19 billion tons are gained each year. According to calculations, the Earth's 400 meters of seafloor sediment would have naturally accumulated in less than 12 million years, not billions of years, as Darwinists claim. This refutes the idea the Earth is 4.5 billion years old and coheres well with the idea of a catastrophic global flood leading to the rapid accumulation of sea sediment around 4,500 years ago. Now, in regards to early finds, soft tissue, hemoglobin, and collagen have been found in discovered dinosaur bones. Yet, these things could not last for 65 million years, which is when Darwinists claim such dinosaurs walked the Earth. And in regards to newer finds, molecules such as proteins, sugars, pigments, DNA, cells, blood, skin, ligaments, blood vessels, and retinas have been found in fossils of dinosaurs and other animals supposedly many millions of years old. Yet again, these could not survive over such an allegedly long period of time. This proves that such fossils are not actually many millions of years old, as Darwinists assert. Another proof for a young Earth is that the Earth's magnetic field has been decaying so fast that according to calculations, it could not be more than about 10,000 years old. Now, because Darwinists have bought into millions and billions of years despite the problems we covered, they often scoff at the idea of a young Earth and the biblical account of a catastrophic and global flood around 4,500 years ago. Yet, the majority of them do not realize just how much historical and geological evidence there is for one, evidence which unbelieving models fail to properly account for. In recent decades, various early Earth scientists have put forth strong cases for a global flood. There are excellent books written by geologists arguing for a global flood scientifically. Two of the best and most up-to-date ones are John D. Morris's 2012 work, The Global Flood, and Andrew A. Snelling's large two-volume 2009 work, Earth's Catastrophic Past. First, traditions of a global flood are widespread in hundreds of far-reaching cultures across the world. John D. Morris notes one study documented over 200 such flood legends. According to that study, 95% of the flood legends affirm the flood was global, 88% affirm there was a favored family or individual. 66% affirm a remnant was forewarned. 70% affirm survival was due to a boat. 67% affirm animals were also saved. 57% affirm survivors ended up on a mountain. 35% affirm birds were sent out. And 66% affirm the wickedness of man was the cause of the flood. The majority of these cultures had no obvious or recent contact. Hence, the biblical position all cultures or people groups descend from Noah and his family accounts for the similarity in these dispersed legends. Man's Noahic descent provides intelligibility 
for why such common features exist in them. Second, if the Genesis Flood occurred, we would expect to see widespread rapid water deposited strata in the geologic record. That is, we would expect to see evidence of the global flood rapidly depositing strata across the world. And this is precisely what has been discovered by geologists. For example, in the Dakota Formation of the Western United States, a sandstone averaging 30 meters thick spans an area of around 850,000 square kilometers. Moreover, the 30 meter thick Permian strata of Western Canada covers around 470,000 kilometers, etc. Many similar examples of this sort of proof for the Genesis Flood can be cited. Thirdly, salt deposits are large, thick layers of salt covering wide geographic areas. How do we explain this? Now, we do observe modern, small examples of evaporation of salt water, which leave behind thin salt layers heavily contaminated with other minerals and plant fragments. However, the world's great salt layers in question are relatively free from such contaminants. Thus, the uniformitarian evaporation models do not account for these, since again, evaporation of salt water leads to contaminants being blended with the salt. Others, therefore, have developed hydrothermal flood models, which explain such salt beds. They argue large volumes of supersaturated hot brines were released into the oceans during the global flood, resulting in these great salt layers. Indeed, Genesis 711 says during the flood, all the fountains of the Great Deep were broken up which refers to, among other things, hot water containing salt-saturated brines. And, as Morris notes, these superheated, supersaturated waters would have lost their ability to retain their load when they encountered the cooler oceans, resulting in great layers of precipitated salts. Thus, the world's great salt deposits are evidence for the biblical flood. Fourth, fossil graveyards are important to consider. There are many examples of these where large amounts of organisms were buried alive together and fossilized, indicating rapid and catastrophic burial. We do not observe this today, but we know it did happen in the past. The question is, how? In his works, Snelling covers around a dozen examples of this phenomenon around the world, though many more could be mentioned. In the case of the Carboniferous Montague Shale in France, there is a large fossil graveyard consisting of organisms from vastly different habitats, all buried catastrophically together. A global flood accounts for this. In the case of the Carboniferous Francis Creek Shale in Illinois, more than 100,000 fossil specimens representing more than 400 species were rapidly buried together. This is again best explained by the Genesis Flood. Also, in some cases, such as the Cretaceous Jadokta Formation in Mongolia, very large animals and dinosaurs were rapidly buried and fossilized together. Thus, Snelling notes, to bury alive such large animals and dinosaurs implies rapid water flow and catastrophic deposition of the sand. Again, the best explanation for all these massive fossil graveyards around the world is the biblical global flood. Fifth, Morris notes there is evidence of clasks, which are sedimentary deposits containing massive boulders of one kind of rock, which have been transported to their present location alongside another kind of rock. Some of these clasks are gigantic, unmovable boulders. How did they get to their present locations? A global flood accounts for these, since when the fountains of the Great Deep were broken open, they were created, and then carried by catastrophic turbidity currents. Sixth, while working at Los Alamos National Laboratories, geophysicist John Baumgartner developed a global flood model of the Earth's history using supercomputer simulations. His model showed that due to the flood, tectonic plate movement occurred very rapidly instead of over millions of years, as the conventional plate tectonics model claims. His global flood tectonic plate model is able to explain more geologic data than the conventional millions of years model, such as horizontal and vertical magnetic patterns on seafloor rock, ultra-high pressure minerals, significant simultaneous uplift of all of today's high mountains, and slabs of crust that penetrated deep into the Earth's mantle but are still relatively cool. Indeed, aspects of his model were independently duplicated or verified by others as well and he has been acknowledged as developing the world's best 3D supercomputer model of plate tectonics by the prestigious New Scientist magazine. This model's accuracy is good evidence for the biblical flood. In a 1933 Nuremberg speech, Adolf Hitler voiced his acceptance of Darwinism. The gulf between the lowest creature, which can still be styled man, and our highest races, is greater than that between the lowest type of man and the highest ape. 
Thus, there results the subjection of a number of people under the will often of only a few persons, a subjection based simply on the right of the stronger, a right which, as we see it in nature, can be regarded as the sole conceivable right. Historians of Nazi Germany, such as Richard Wieckart and others, note the title of Hitler's principal book, Mein Kampf, which means my struggle, echoes Darwin's often repeated phrase, struggle for existence. Moreover, in the book Mein Kampf, Hitler stated stronger races must dominate and not blend with weaker ones, otherwise, quote, any conceivable higher evolution of organic living beings would be unthinkable. In the same work, he explicitly wrote, the first step which outwardly and visibly removed man from animal was that of intention. In Hitler's long unpublished sequel to Mein Kampf, known today simply as Hitler's second book, he clearly affirmed his belief in Darwinian evolution. The struggle for survival, in turn, contains the precondition for evolution. Nature, out of the multitude of creatures that are born, spares the few healthiest and most robust in the struggle for survival. Thus, it is extremely unhelpful and deceptive when evolutionists such as Aaron Ra from YouTube try to falsely claim that Hitler was not an evolutionist in order to try to protect Darwinism. I challenged creationists many times to show me where Hitler ever promoted or accepted evolution. Serious historians agree Hitler was an evolutionist. Professor of History at California State University Richard Weichart observes, Hitler spoke and wrote incessantly about evolution, natural selection, and the struggle for existence, especially the struggle between races. It should be patently obvious from these discussions that he believed in human evolution. Even the evolutionist writer contemporary with Hitler, Sir Arthur Keith, conceded, The German Fuhrer, as I have consistently maintained, is an evolutionist. He has consistently sought to make the practice of Germany conform with the theory of evolution. Professor William J. Duker notes, virulent German nationalism, anti-Semitism, and anti-communism were linked together by a social Darwinian theory of struggle that stressed the right of superior nations to Lebensraum through expansion and the right of superior individuals to secure authoritarian leadership over the masses. In fact, a 1937 Nazi propaganda film demonstrates the Darwinism of the Nazi party. Alles Lebensschwache geht in der Natur unfehlbar zugrunde. Wir Menschen haben gegen dieses Gesetz der natürlichen Auslese in den letzten Jahrzehnten furchtbar gesündigt. Wir haben unwertes Leben nicht nur erhalten, wir haben ihm auch Vermehrung gewährt. Die Nachkommen dieser Kranken sahen so aus. In den letzten 70 Jahren hat sich unser Volk um 50 Prozent vermehrt, während die Zahl der Erbkranken im gleichen Zeitraum um 450 Prozent gestiegen ist. Wenn diese Entwicklung so weiterliefe, würde schon in 50 Jahren auf vier gesunde Menschen ein Erbkranker kommen. Ein endloser Zug des Grauens würde in die Nation hineinmarschieren. Maßloses Elend über ein wertvolles Volk kommen. Indeed, Darwin's spokesman in Germany, the fraud Ernst Haeckel, is well known to be the great ancestor of Nazi biological theoreticians. Nazism's Darwinism is also confirmed by a speech given by the German commander of occupied Ukraine, Erich Koch, who declared, We are the master race, which must remember that the lowliest German worker is racially and biologically a thousand times more valuable than the population here in Ukraine. It was because of these Darwinian ideas that Hitler and the Nazis murdered Jews, blacks, gypsies, Poles, and many others, so that the allegedly superior German Aryan race could rule the world through survival of the fittest. Miklos Nayetsli was an eyewitness doctor who worked at the Auschwitz concentration camp under the supervision of the notorious criminal doctor, Joseph Mengele. He wrote that Mengele, quote, sent millions of people to death merely because, according to racial theory, they were inferior beings and therefore detrimental to mankind. Racial theory was taught by Charles Darwin's pre-Hitler students Ernst Haeckel and Thomas Huxley. Racial theory states, through Darwinian natural selection, superior races of humans compete against inferior ones for dominance. Nayetsli notes he spent long hours with Mengele and that, quote, the immediate objective was the increased reproduction of pure Germans in numbers sufficient to replace the Czechs, Hungarians, Poles, all of whom were condemned to be destroyed. Historian Robert Payne likewise notes according to the Nazis, Jews, Poles, and Russians were subhuman and did not deserve to live. The final outcome of the Darwinism of the Nazis was the Holocaust of around 6 million Jews 
whom Hitler especially hated and deemed inferior and unfit to live. As history proves, Darwinism clearly played a key role in the evil decision-making of Hitler and the Nazis. The work World War II in Europe notes that according to Hitler and the Nazis, quote, the Jews were biologically inferior. A solution had to be found to the Jewish problem because the very presence of the Jews threatened the purity of the German population. With regards to the communist mass murderer Joseph Stalin, Darwinism was a major part of his worldview as well. At first Stalin was a theology student, but while in school, he began to read Darwin and Darwinian Marxist authors. He then left Christianity and became an avid Darwinist and militant atheist. When Stalin came into power and led the Soviet Union, he ordered the systematic killing of people on a massive scale. Scholars such as Koster give two reasons for his mass murder. One, he murdered people who were threats to him and the progress of his programs, which in Marxist Darwinian terms meant some sort of evolution to an earthly paradise. Two. He murdered Christians because he hated God and Christians. During the so-called Great Purge or Great Terror, Stalin murdered Christians as well as those he suspected might threaten his position or agenda. Around 1.5 million people were shot. Many more died in penal labor camps in Siberian exile. In showing his hatred for Christians, Stalin bulldozed dozens of churches in Moscow. And Bruce Shelley notes, by 1939, the atheistic propaganda, the rigid anti-religion laws, and the Stalinist terror brought the Russian Orthodox Church to the brink of disintegration. The Lutherans were almost wiped out, and the Baptists and Evangelical Christian denominations were ravaged. Indeed, if you're a Darwinist political leader who believes humans are just animals, it is not unreasonable to execute people you feel are holding back your country's evolutionary progress. If only Stalin remained a Christian and had an objective basis to actually value human beings as being made in God's image, he would not have murdered Christians as well as other civilians who contradicted his agenda. Worldviews bear directly upon actions, and for Stalin, much like with Hitler, Darwinism contributed to his evil decision-making. As Catchpool and Harwood observe, human life having no inherent value easily leads to the ruthless elimination of the unfit, even when people are designated unfit for political reasons. The Chinese Communist Party leader, Mao Zedong, is another mass murderer who clung to Darwinism. Scholars note he devoured the writings of Darwin and other Darwinists like Huxley. He said, Darwin's theory of evolution was a correct and good thing. As he devoured Darwin, he also became skeptical of religion. Jerry Bergman notes that Mao openly advocated achieving world communism by both violence and war, selection of the fittest. He ended up mass murdering 30 million of his Chinese citizens. Kenneth Su was a student in China during Mao Zedong's reign. He wrote that Darwinism was applied to daily life in China and that Darwinian propaganda was forced onto everyone. He also notes that Mao was convinced that without the continual pressure of natural selection, humans would degenerate. This inspired Mao to advocate the ceaseless revolution that brought my homeland to the brink of ruin. Su notes, We were victims of a cruel social ideology that assumes that competition among individuals, classes, nations, or races is the natural condition of life and that it is also natural for the superior to dispossess the inferior. Now, Pol Pot was a Cambodian revolutionary who led the party known as the Khmer Rouge. He was also a follower of Mao Zedong. The historian Paul Johnson notes Pol Pot was, quote, introduced by his professor, Jean-Paul Sartre, to the idea of evolution to higher forms, of which he translated in terms of urban-rural struggle in which one-fourth of the population died. Indeed, in just three years, Pol Pot led the Khmer Rouge to genocide up to three million people of the eight million Cambodian population. Jonas Alexis notes, Pol Pot applied Darwin's ideas in the slaughter of a vast number of Cambodians. The popular Khmer Rouge slogan was, to keep you is no benefit. 
to destroy you is no loss. Again, worldviews where humans are just animals bear directly upon actions. Another Darwinian impact on society is racism. Charles Darwin himself was a well-known racist. Like Hitler after him, he taught there were inferior races and affirmed that certain quote-unquote savage races, like Negroes and Australian Aborigines, were biologically in between apes and humans. He said civilized humans, quote, will most certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. At the same time, the anthropomorphous ape will no doubt be exterminated. The break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider, for it will intervene between man and a more civilized state, as we may hope, even in the Caucasian, and some ape as low as a baboon, instead of as now, between the Negro or Australian, and the gorilla. Darwin also said, the civilized races have extended and are now everywhere extending their range so as to take the place of the lower races. It's no wonder where Hitler and the Nazis acquired their idea of superior and inferior races competing for dominance. In fact, Jerry Bergman has shown that most of Darwin's leading disciples expounded racism for over a century. For example, famous Darwinist and agnostic writer Thomas Huxley said, no rational man cognizant of the facts believes that the average Negro is equal, still less superior, of the average white man. Dozens more examples could be cited. A tragic example of the idiotic racism Darwinism produced concerns Oda Banga, a pygmy who was put on display at a zoo in America as an example of an alleged inferior ape-like evolutionary savage. Actually, he was a twice-married father who was captured from his homeland and then exploited by Darwinists for propaganda purposes. Oda Banga ended up committing suicide because of this racist Darwinian brutality. Another effect Darwinism has had on society is smaller scale mass murders by Darwinists on the basis of their evolutionary ideas. Once again, you've been listening to KMGH-TV's live coverage of the shooting at uh, Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado. In 1999, two Darwinists murdered 15 students of Columbine High School in Colorado. On the day of the shooting, one of the killers, Eric Harris, wore a t-shirt that said, Natural Selection on it. This is according to the autopsy of Eric Harris performed by Dr. Ben Galloway. The killers were also fascinated by Hitler's evolutionary belief of a master race. They committed their mass murders on Hitler's birthday, April 20th, in commemoration of him. In what are known as the Columbine Basement Tapes, transcripts of which were released to the public by police, Columbine killer Dylan Klebold said, it's humans that I hate. Whatever happened to natural selection? Another example is Pekka Avinen, who in 2007 shot seven school students in Finland, as well as a teacher. This Darwinist posted various videos online before the murders, in which he espoused his evolutionary and anti-God beliefs. He even called himself Natural Selector 89 on YouTube. Although his videos have been deleted, except for two, near the time of the massacre, routers reported in his videos he said things like, I, as a natural selector, will eliminate all who I see unfit, disgraces of human race, and failures of natural selection. Hello everyone, this is me, Natural Selector 89, talking to you. He would also curse and blaspheme God in his videos, and express his hate for religion and religious people, much like we see from many atheists online today. One could also mention the Darwinist James J. Lee, who in 2010, armed himself with bombs and a gun holding three hostages at the Discovery Channel building in Maryland. His demands included, quote, the Discovery Channel and its affiliate channels must have daily television programs at primetime slots featuring leading scientists who understand and agree with Malthus, Darwin science. Develop shows that mention Malthusian sciences about food production leads to overpopulation of the human race. Talk about evolution. Talk about Malthus and Darwin until it sinks into the stupid people's brains until they get it. After attempting to murder one of the hostages, police were able to shoot Lee and end the standoff. During the standoff, Lee said, I don't care about these people. Again, worldviews impact decisions, and it was because these mass murderers affirmed Darwinism and denied Christianity, which is why they were able to justify their evil actions and disregard human life so easily. They had no objective basis to view humans as anything other than beasts. In his popular books, Richard Dawkins often refers to humans as we animals. Likewise, even DiscoveryKids.com put out a children's article called Are Humans Considered Animals? It says, are you asking if humans are animals? If so, 
The answer is yes. It is very common for school textbooks and television shows to teach this idea to children. In light of this, is it really that surprising that humans grow up behaving like wild animals? Even the Darwinian atheist Daniel Dennett conceded that evolution was like a universal acid that dissolves all traditional ethical and moral systems. He speaks of, quote, Darwin's idea bearing an unmistakable likeness to universal acid. It eats through just about every traditional concept. Traditional moral values are one of those concepts it eats through. Witness the filthy behavior in popular culture. We observe people thinking they are beasts and thus engaging in filthy beast-like behavior such as fornication, murder, rape, homosexuality, cheating, pornography, fighting, lust, stripping, wild partying, orgies, dancing nude in the streets, etc. People have actually been deceived to think they are just beasts and thus they act accordingly. The unbelieving Darwinist Max Hokut realized in his worldview there is no meaningful moral standard. The non-existence of God means that there is no absolute morality. This position led him to assert the following, human beings may make up their own rules. This is consistent Darwinian atheism. In fact, the famous Darwinist atheist Lawrence Krauss shamelessly admitted that on his worldview, he had no meaningful basis to condemn human incest. Why is incest wrong? It's, uh, it's not clear to me that it's wrong. Okay. It's clear to me, it, there's, a, there's an evolution. No, no, no. After all, if people are just animals, then there's no real basis to criticize their incest. Beasts will be beasts. Consistent Darwinism logically leads to gross immorality and the moral decay of society. And that is what we are seeing today. Just look at the United States since Darwinism has become popular. In television programs, Darwinian atheists enjoy, such as Family Guy, Two and a Half Men, American Dad, Real Time with Bill Maher, South Park, etc. You see things like foul language, mocking God, casual sexual relationships, violence, drunkenness, liberalism, homosexuality, the mocking of conservative values, and other immoral behavior. This is what young Darwinian atheists take in every day and enjoy, and it corrodes the moral framework of our society. A new poll done by the Discovery Institute of more than 3,400 American adults showed that belief in evolution has eroded belief in human value. According to the survey, 43% of Americans now affirm that, quote, evolution shows that no living thing is more important than any other. And 45% of Americans believe that, quote, evolution shows that human beings are not fundamentally different from other animals, end quote. The highest levels of support for the idea that evolution shows that humans aren't fundamentally different from other animals are found among self-identified atheists, 69%, agnostics, 60%, and 18 to 29 year olds, 51%. These people act like beasts because they are taught they are beasts since childhood. To further prove our thesis, a famous Darwinist atheist group known as the Rational Response Squad deceived a lot of people to adopt Darwinism and deny Christianity. The extremely foul-mouthed and immoral group was known for creating the Blasphemy Challenge, which challenged young people to post online videos of themselves denying the Holy Spirit in order to try to commit the unforgivable sin and go to hell. They made sure to spread Darwinism and atheism any way they could lectures, debates, writings, podcasts, live streams, etc. Even well-known atheist apologist Richard Carrier was a high-ranking member of this group. Also, they were supported by famous Darwinists like Richard Dawkins, who appeared on their podcast for hours. Well, what happened to the Rational Response Squad? It broke up when two of its leaders, a married couple, separated due to the woman choosing to become a prostitute and pornography performer. After that, the anti-God Darwinian group faded into shameful obscurity. Again, if you get conditioned to believe you're just an animal, then you're going to act like one. This is another negative effect of Darwinism on society. So why are so many people so eager to embrace macroevolution? Why is Darwinism taught in schools and paraded as science in popular culture when, as we've observed, there are so many problems with it and many scientists are beginning to abandon it? The idea man was not created and that all creatures derive from a single-celled organism contradicts the biblical Christian worldview. 
and it is because unsaved, unregenerate people naturally hate God and Christianity, which is why evolution has been so readily adopted by the masses since Darwin's time, and it is why Christians and creationism are despised by Darwinists. If one convinces themselves evolution is true and that the Christian worldview is wrong, then no longer is the person confronted with topics they despise, such as sin, moral commandments, accountability, judgment after death, and God. As Richard Dawkins said, evolution is one of the reasons I don't believe in God. Accountability to a holy creator disappears when Darwinism is adopted and consistently maintained. That is why Darwinism is so popular in our Western culture. Our culture does not want God. Jesus' Apostle Paul's inspired letter to the Colossians notes that towards God, unsaved people are, quote, alienated and hostile in mind, end quote. The God of the Old Testament, jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic... The, we do not identify... No. The, I know you don't. That's why I'm calling no. you on it. I want to know who it is. Well, let me explain, just let me admit explain it. It's why religion. Very why simple. You just can't... It's religion. There You're is information encoded in the cell, Mr. Abrams. Yeah. Digital code. If you found information, the software code, in any other realm of experience, yeah. you would infer that an intelligence had played a role. Yeah. You might not be able to tell, no, however, but, but from that, analyzing but that, but the no, evidence... That assumes... Wait a second. That assumes evolution doesn't exist. Do you believe that that God, if he's provided everything for you, has rights on your life? No. Because? Why should he? Alrighty. So what we've, what we've basically done is determine how you'd be doing on Judgment Day. It doesn't sound like you'd measure up at all the God's Ten Commandments. Who gives a Likewise, in his letter to the Romans, it is said, quote, the carnal mind is hostile against God, end quote. People accept Darwinism because they are hostile to God. They hate accountability, judgment, and God's law and they want to rebel against God. In the same epistle, we see an accurate description of Darwinists who suppress their innate knowledge of God so they can continue in their fallen ways. We're told that such heathen, quote, by their unrighteousness suppress the truth, for what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So, they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men, and birds and animals and creeping things." End quote. Many Darwinists have implicitly conceded that they affirm evolution in order to escape God, his commandments, and judgment after death. Richard Dawkins declares his Darwinian worldview leads him to believe the universe has, quote, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference, end quote. And we wonder why we see so much indifference towards good and evil in our lands. Evolutionist William B. Provine said, let me summarize my views on what modern evolutionary biology tells us loud and clear. There are no gods. There's no life after death. When I die, I am absolutely certain that I'm going to be dead. That's the end for me. There's no ultimate foundation for ethics." End quote. The notorious serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer agreed with Provine's and Dawkins' Darwinian atheistic philosophy when he murdered and mutilated numerous people. He believed there was no design or ultimate foundation for ethics as well. When he died, he thought, he was dead. I always, I always believe the uh, evolution is truth, the theory of evolution is truth, that we all just came from uh, the slime and uh, when, we, when we died, you know, that was it. There was nothing. Mm -hmm.